My father's bones lay cast aside. His face adorns a mantle. No Kalish could call him god now. What's up, meta nerds? This video will be a complete breakdown of the Kalish species in both canon and legends, a people that would be most known through the cyborg general of the CIS. But first, let's thank this video's sponsor, Swagbucks. It's actually really cool to work with them since I did use Swagbucks to make some extra money back in college in the form of PayPal gift cards. The way it works is that brands and advertisers want you to check out their stuff, and so Swagbucks organizes all these different offers, and for just watching videos, playing video games, taking surveys, or even just buying stuff online, they'll pay you for it. You even get an extra $5 bonus just for signing up and taking your first survey. On their site, you can see just how many SB points you get for each offer, and then hop into the Rewards tab to see how much you can redeem it for. I prefer the Xbox and PlayStation gift cards, and of course the Visa and PayPal. It really is that easy, so head down to the description to start making money today. Thank you Swagbucks for sponsoring this, and for all the money back in college. And let's go ahead back to the Kali species. And we'll start by heading to their homeworld of Kali, located at Grid Coordinates J7 in Wild Space. Their neighbors were a bug species called the Yamri, hailing from the planet Huck, and they were just off the hyperlanes that contained Munalist, the headquarters of the intergalactic banking clan, and the worlds in Tralla and Jamis, which would become major shipwrights of the First Order. The Kalish species would evolve in this mostly temperate, jungle-covered world, a planet that was also dotted in some arctic regions and deserts, with large seas and incredibly wide and long rivers. These sentient reptiles would have skin colors and hues of red, orange, and yellow, and would have these flat, elongated faces, which are often compared to bats with their flat nose and large ears that flared out. Their eyes were always yellow, and out of their jawline grew these four tusks, the size of which could vary greatly across individuals. While they also had five toes on each foot, and hands that had two thumbs and two fingers. Despite being reptiles and covered in tough scales, which were great for defense, the females sported long black or brown hair. This may seem odd, but hair, feathers, and scales are all made up of the same stuff, like keratin, and so it appears that the Kalish biology has produced this unique combo of scales and hair, which also has some parallels in the classification known as reptomammals, which the Tauntauns belong to, who are actually lizards covered in a thick fur. There's also the Rhodian species, which are reptiles where males have no hair, just these spikes, while the females could have these thick mohawks of hair. This is a good time to point out that there is no evidence that there is any direct genetic manipulation by the Rakata, like we saw with the Zabrak and Twi'lek, but as some Coruscanti biologists believe, it may be proof of the galactic scale of experimentation by the Celestials, the legendary ancient forerunners of the galaxy that shaped the stars and created intelligent life and planted them across the stars, explaining these curious connections between species separated by thousands of light years, and why there are so many different humanoid species. Now we can assume that with these ears, their sense of hearing was excellent, though their vision may be weak, because when Grievous was put into his cyborg body, they placed surgical implants in his eyes. They of course developed their own language, but they also communicated through pheromones, especially in mate selection which was quite numerous over their lifetime as all the various tribes on Kali would practice polygamy, a form of polygamy where a male would have multiple wives. Grievous, for example, would take 10 wives and father 30 children in his short life in his full organic form. You also notice that their legs are plantigrade like humans, not digitigrade like Grievous's cyborg form, a change that required areas of his brain to be surgically altered to control this metal body more easily. Your average Kalish would stand 1.6 to 1.8 meters tall, or 5 feet 7 inches, which makes them similar to humans, and also with a similar lifespan to many other humanoids, being around 80 years, both things that were more evidence towards the Celestials creating all humanoids. Over the millennia, the Kalish would emerge to dominate their environment, hunting the Mu Muo boars, and careful not to fall prey to the Krabak both creatures whose bones would be kept and ritually consecrated by the shamans to imbue special powers. These bones worn all over the body while the skull was attached to the face. These were so important to the Kalish that outsiders almost never saw one without a mask, and we can infer that this likely also worked as a rite of passage to adulthood. And the leader would go through an extension of this ceremony, which was the transition from adult to the lord of the tribe. A ritual that was witnessed firsthand by Darth Malgus, saying, quote, These Kalish are warlike, ritualistic people. In my brief time on Kali, I observed the ritual by which they chose their war leader. War and religion was everything to the Kalish, with there never being any form of unified global government, just countless tribes engaged in war with their neighbors. 
Though each tribe did have a similar structure and reverence for their shamans, who did things like the consecration of materials just mentioned, but also dream interpretation, rites for death and birth, and the maintenance of holy sites. The most sacred site being Shrupak, a place that would protect the bodies of the Kalish so that they could live on in the afterlife. And then there were sites like Abesmi, an island monolith in the Genua Sea that was believed by all the shamans across the planet to be the site from which the gods ascended into heaven. Kalish shamans from all over the world would maintain an altar for worship to what might have originally been an alien race that seeded populations across the galaxy. These gods may be how the celestials were remembered over the eons. If so, they certainly weren't the last aliens to set down on Kali. By the 3600s BBY, different groups were making landings on this wild space world, and recruiting the toughest of these reptilians into their ranks, many Kalish finding a place as mercenaries and working with the huts or as assistants to bounty hunters. All admired their proud warrior ways, and their refusal to remove their skull mask was known long before some of the Mandalorian groups that would have a similar relationship to their helmet. Though this also created an insult to call them bone lizards, and at least to Wookiees, their smell was horrendous. With Bodar saying, quote, <clears throat> I fought the bone lizards before. Their smell was worse than their bite. Most Kalish would choose not to fight for the Sith Empire, in part due to their overall anti-alien sentiments, but also for their use of slave labor, a trade that was just starting to take an interest on Kali, seeing these hardy people as perfect for exploitation. When a Kalish slave did exhibit force abilities, like Zelek, they were attached to a Sith Lord to be trained as an apprentice, while Razor and Sace Rogan did gain their own titles of Sith Lord. And on the Jedi side, there was Sin Tykan, who was able to conceptualize his warrior instincts as being in service of the light, and seeing his life overall as a new sort of shaman, using his connection with the spiritual side and to nature to focus what he wanted to study from the sciences of these offworlders eventually using this all to come up with ways to save ecosystems ravaged by the galactic scale wars, taking the head on the restoration of Taurus, among many other worlds. But with these offworlders also came some new weapons to fight each other with in their endless tribal rivalries. Most common was the use of the Zerka Arms Outland Rifles alongside the Lig Sword and Shoni Spear. And then the first of the Republic abuses would occur in 65 BBY. The Bithavrians were allies, but not a member world of the Republic, and tensions to secede were bubbling up in this decade on many worlds, which would ultimately explode in the formation of the CIS and the resulting Clone War. But this 43 years before the Battle of Geonosis, the Republic was trying to use covert means to keep hold of power, and sent military instructors to provide the Kalish with falsified information which made it seem like the Bithavrians were about to strike Kali. These Republic instructors helped to train and supply a proxy military force to attack the secessionists. And Kaiman Jai Shilal's grandmother was actually involved in a strike team alongside Jedi Knights. What makes this action by the Republic even worse is their inaction throughout the Huck War. There's no defined start date for this war, as it was a gradual increase in the Huck raids on Kali over numerous generations that would see millions of Kalish captured and sold into slavery. Kaiman Jai Shalal would become a nightmare to the Bug Invaders, being the greatest warrior of the time, but then became unstoppable when he met his lover Runduru Lij Kumar. She was a great warrior from one of the rare Arctic regions known as Gridanju, and she believed herself to be a descendant of the gods, while Shilal was certain that he was on the path to ascending to godhood. When they fought together, they were able to prove so effective against the technologically superior Bugs that they were able to unify the Kalish people to a greater degree than ever before calling on the Kol Pravis, a great band of tribes, to give him command of the Azashra, the greatest warriors from across the planet. When they captured the slaver ships and took the fight to the Huck colony worlds, they were able to destroy entire cities and populations as they closed in on the Bugs' homeworld. The Republic decided that now was the time to intervene, as the Yamri had powerful friends in the Senate and could not let this fighting come to home. Shalal, who at this point had taken the name Grievous, was painted as a violent monster on a warpath, when the reality was that his species was standing up to the slavers that had terrorized them for decades. The Jedi would aid Republic forces and finally push Grievous and his Azashra back to Kali. This loss was followed by one of the most horrific decisions in Republic history, as the Warlord narrative helped the Yamri's friends in the Senate pass embargoes on Kali, which stopped all off-world trade, leading to widespread poverty and starvation. Grievous was utterly defeated, but surprisingly, the banking clan said that they could make all of these problems disappear. If Grievous would lead their debt-collecting droid army, they would not only open trade, but actively promote it, 
This warlord and vanquisher of slavers accepted this deal with the Munes, and in this odd way he did save his people. Grievous was beloved and respected by all of the tribes on Kali, and it wasn't long before they would have to cry out to their hero once more. The Huck had returned, and seemingly out of spite, they desecrated holy burial sites. These bugs found ways to not only terrorize them in this world, but were now attacking Kalish in the afterlife. He abandoned the banker army, rushing home to gather his Zasra, receive a blessing by the shaman, and take the war to the slavers one last time. But the Sith were always plotting. They worked with Sand Hill and Poggle the Lesser to trap Grievous into a life of servitude, imprisoning him in a cyborg body. With surgical precision, the general's men were eliminated, the best warriors of all the Kalish, and he was left clinging on to life. Sith sorcery and Geonosian surgery created a being that would be consumed with destroying the Republic and Jedi. His hatred for the Huck replaced and focused towards the Force wielders and their allies. When Grievous died on Utapau in 19 BBY, his people were certain that he had become a god, being added to the Pantheon and worshipped across his homeworld. A few years later, a former Azashra named Bentili Sanskar was able to coordinate a strike on the Yamri on the planet Open. Clearing the bugs out, he helped establish the first permanent Kalish colony, but it wouldn't be long before they were challenged by alien invaders. This time it was the humans of the Empire. Same Republic under new management as far as Ska'ar was concerned, and when they came to inform him that the Kalish would owe tribute to the Empire, a new war was ignited that would last for 10 years. To stop these wild space rebels, the Emperor deployed then Captain Thrawn. He was eager to study this mysterious race, but the Chiss, who was known to have the greatest mind in the galaxy, was stumped by Kalish culture. He admitted to not being able to understand their art or stories, and so finally he went with a complete planetary bombardment, being okay with losing this culture to history, and brought about enough destruction that the war came to an abrupt halt. Ska'ar himself was captured, however, and when he was brought before the triumphant Chiss, he actually praised the Imp for the ruthlessly efficient use of his amazing high-tech weaponry. Having no hard feelings about the slaughter of his people, since they all died as warriors, greater weapons winning the day, not sneaky bombs planted in ships, or running to allies to invoke political and economic pressure. When Palpatine met Ska'ar, he was impressed with the Kalisha spirit, and gave him command of an Imperial army. He and Thrawn would be a few of the non-humans to serve in powerful roles in the Empire, though he would meet an unceremonious death at the hands of Chewbacca when the Wookiee threw a gun mount into the Kalisha ship, which caused it to explode. But during this Imperial era, Kali did retain most of its autonomy, with the Kulk Pravis coming under the command of a female that was said to be Grievous' lover, Kumar, reincarnated. The last time we see the Kalish are with this stormtrooper during the Second Imperial Civil War under Darth Krayt, and with the pirate Sidon Athano. He is said to be a Kalish, and you can even see some similarities with the design of the mask and the fact that he never takes it off, but right here we can transition into our cool stuff and behind the scenes facts, as canon Kalish depictions are unnecessarily off. Starting with the hands, they seem to have a human-like forefinger and one thumb hand, not the two fingers and two thumbs, while well, they are also described as digitigrade, though no depiction shows that, and almost everything about the lore is the same, even Grievous' backstory, so I don't get what's up with these odd changes. One oddness that was not added but was actually kept from Legends is that it's said that their organs are quote, extremely flammable which I just think is a weird way to justify Grievous bursting into flames. I think it's just a simpler and better explanation being that it was just a unique chemical soup in his synth sack. Speaking of which, I wasn't sure how to work this in, but here's a look at Grievous's organs, which we see when he has an experience with the Force itself in a canon comic. Legends also has some issues with the depiction of Kalish over the decades, with them first being introduced in comics from the 80s, but the way they look, they might as well be a different species. Though their behavior and history otherwise is the same, it wouldn't be for a few decades later until the Star Wars Clone Wars animated series that we first saw Grievous, and then further details on his species were provided in the new Essential Guide to Alien Species, the Atlas, and Essential Guide to Warfare. So that's it for the Kalish species. Thanks for watching. If you liked it, please hit that like button and comment something that you learned or something that you still want to learn about. Uh, all that helps to promote the video here on YouTube. And if you want to check out more stuff, you could head down to the description where you'll see a ton of our other species videos, our uh, complete playlist, tons of other Star Wars playlists, as well as a ton of other links to help support the channel, these cool metal print arts from Display, and free audiobooks from Audible. And then there's our Patreon and PayPal. Special thanks to our supporters over on Patreon, especially our $25 tier, Chris Garcia, 
Cascostello, C7 Go, Matthew Beltrami, Seraf Diaz, and Bill Payne. But most important of all, remember, if you live in the Outer Rim, don't trust the Republic, and the Force will be with you, always.